Hi everyone, welcome to this PowerPoint on fishing and aquaculture for AP Environmental Science. We are looking at two learning objectives and like much of this unit, we're contrasting the um, unsustainable methods with a more sustainable method. So topic 5.8, impacts of overfishing and 5.16, aquaculture. Um, the learning objective, or sorry, the enduring understanding for the first is when humans use natural resources, they alter natural systems. So we've seen that one several times um, already. And the learning objective describe causes of and problems related to overfishing. For aquaculture, humans can mitigate their land, um, sorry, their impact on land and water resources through sustainable use. Obviously, we're not looking at land, we're looking at water for aquaculture. And for the learning objective, describe the benefits and drawbacks of aquaculture because there are both pros and cons of it. Vocab is pretty brief and rather simple. And let's just jump into what we're talking about fishing. So fishing, you all know, but I have to define it. Um, it's the practice of catching, trepping, or otherwise procuring freshwater or marine organisms. That includes fish, it includes mollusks, some people would include alligators or crocodiles in this, um, turtles, really anything that we're taking from the water. So it does not have to be just fish, even though we're calling it fishing. So getting a crab, uh, sorry, a lobster up here um, is technically fishing at least for this class. And this has been practiced, um, all the various ways of fishing has been practiced um, sustainably since the Paleolithic. This actually predates agriculture by tens of thousands of years. Um, so very ancient practice. But this is not a history course um, and we're not here to talk about the history of fishing. What we're here to talk about is what's happening today and um, in the past you know, couple hundred years with overfishing specifically. By some authors, um, it's estimated that at least um, many, fish, many fishing stocks in the Western world have been overexploited since the 1600s. Some people push that date back to the 19th and 20th centuries when industrialization really accelerated and global markets and ways of preserving fish um, really, um, really increased. That could be preservation could include just putting them on ice. It could be pickling um, or drying. OK, um, today it's estimated that as little as a third or up to two thirds of the world's fish stocks are currently overfished. I've seen some authors that claim that all of the world's fisheries are being overfished. That's probably a little bit too extreme, but we're probably looking more around this half to two thirds um, area. The point is, is that many of the world's fish stocks are being overfished and we don't need to put an exact number on that. Um, but I would say anywhere between 50% and 66%. And this is all due really to global demand um, industrialization, like what we see down here. It's so much easier to um, catch huge numbers of fish on a single vessel and we have so many vessels going out it's easy for them to uh, locate fish stocks uh, with modern technology including radar um, sorry not radar but sonar my bad um, and they can travel vast distances um, you know with uh, diesel engines and all of that stuff okay so what is overfishing um, just like any form of overexploitation, overfishing is taking a natural resource um, at a rate greater than it can be replenished. In this case, we're taking fish at a great at a rate greater than they can naturally reproduce. Okay, um, so fishing at a rate beyond which the species can naturally reproduce. This is going to result in lower population sizes. This is what you see with Alaskan halibut um, up on the graph on the top right. Um, what we have here is 1992 to 2021 and the Pacific halibut population size through those years. OK, um, you notice that this that the population is rather large until it declines throughout the uh, late 90s to 2000s and then stabilizes around 2010, probably due to some form of legislation or um, take limits. OK, so regulation. It also leads into harvesting of smaller fish over time. So. The two pictures I have down at the bottom right are to illustrate this concept. I have no idea what dates these pictures were taken, but the general idea is, um, is accurate. The general idea is legitimate. Um, halibut is a very big fish, okay? So you see the man in comparison to the fish on the left. Um, a halibut is a large fish. As we 
over harvest these fish we're um, fishing and fishing and fishing them um, and we're taking the largest individuals from the population because that's what's most desirable and you're removing most large individuals from that population you're also removing many of the younger fish um, and resulting in those younger fish not growing up to become these giant fish so as you remove the old large fish and as you remove young fish from the population before they can reach um, this really large size, you're not going to be catching these large fish anymore. Okay, you've caught them all out to where somebody like this guy on the right thinks that this is a pretty awesome fish that he just caught, where it's um, where it would be dwarfed by a fish that was caught 50 years ago. Okay. Um, the general idea is that you're harvesting smaller fish over time. And this is an example of shifting baselines that we've talked about several times in this class, where you think that this is a great um, fish because this is what you're uh, used to and the 20 years that you've been fishing, but you don't think back to 100, 200 years ago uh, when the fish would uh, reach this really large uh, size at um, a later age in adulthood, okay? As we reduce population sizes and at locally extirpate populations, we're reducing biodiversity. We can, um, this can result in trophic cascades. So let's say that we're talking about sharks. Sharks are keystone species in the reef. They keep down um, the populations of reef eating fish, such as parrotfish. Those parrotfish will um, eat the corals, okay? So you remove the sharks, Parrotfish populations explode and they um, overgraze the coral, leading to the destruction of the reef and um, the local extirpation of all of the organisms that rely on that reef. And then you can result in economic and food security problems that, re that for people that rely on the fishery. If they're um, totally overfishing that stock and that stock becomes depleted, what are they going to do for a living? Okay. So I'm just gonna jump into some methods to mitigate overfishing because we've already talked about um, many of the ways that we are overfishing, whether that is bottom trawling or whether that's um, seining or whether it's wh whatever method it is. I'll refer you back to the PowerPoint where we talked about human impacts on mangroves, coral reefs, and wetlands. Um, and during the coral reefs part, we talked a lot about the overfishing. Many of that was just specific for reefs, but a lot of it applies for um, overfishing in general. So how can we mitigate overfishing? One is government regulation. Now this is a little bit difficult because it's notorial, notoriously difficult to regulate. Um, there's not enough inspectors um, to regulate, so the number of vessels versus the number of regulators, you don't have enough um, regulators, say that there's a thousand vessels for every one regulator. Right, and this guy um, works five days a week, so he's not working 365 days a year. There's no way that he's going to expect all 1,000 of those ships um, that are under his uh, under his um, jurisdiction. Okay, so we need to up the number of regulators. There's this belief in the freedom of international waters that you can do whatever you want to do in international waters because you're not bound by one um, country's laws. So we need to dispel that belief. And there's also the belief of the master of the ship, right? The captain is the uh, master of the ship. He is the ruler of that ship. He's the king of his ship. And he can do whatever he wants on that ship, within reason, of course. Um, so there's that idea as well, that the captain knows what's best and he can do whatever he wants, especially if you couple that with international waters and lax regulation. Okay, and then regulations often face resistance from fishing communities. For example, if you were to set up a marine protected area, which I'll get to on the next slide, um, fishermen are often resistant to that at first until they either are educated to the benefits of a marine protected area, such as um, increased fish stocks due to um, fish being able to reproduce in a protected place and then spilling over to the areas around it, or um, until they see the positive impacts, okay? They see, see it with their own eyes. So they're often resistant um, before then. And that, off, uh, that also makes sense. There's several times in this class where we've talked about how outside agencies will go into a community and try to enforce regulations and all of this stuff on that community. Um, and the people of that community legitimately often resent them because 
why do these outsiders know better than we do? You know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's um, working with the people rather than working against them. You can also find them um, for breaking regulations, um, all of that stuff. You can tax them, all of that. This one is big. Remove subsidies. We're going to watch a couple videos about this in class, so we'll talk about uh, what subsidies are a little bit more in class. But many fisheries are subsidized, especially in the European Union and in the United States. That means that the government, your tax dollars, is, pay, is paying for uh, those fishermen to go out and fish regardless of what they catch. If they don't catch what their quote unquote quota is, then um, they're paid by the government to get up to what they would make um, on the market with that quota. Or they provide tax breaks to those fishermen, again, regardless of what they are catching or are not catching. Okay, so we need to remove subsidies. If they're going out and um, catching just for the sake of catching, fishing just for the sake of fishing and harvesting young fish and not reaching a quota that um, some market is, um, is setting, we need to stop paying them to do that. And obviously fishermen are going to be resistant to that idea because they are um, obviously making money from this, right? It's, it's how they're feeding their children and putting them through school and all that. We also need to set prices to uh, reflect the true cost of those fish, uh, the true cost of fishing, and that includes the externalities, which we've talked about again um, several times in this class. But a higher price is going to really uh, is going to make um, less demand for these fish products. If prices are artificially cheap because of um, your tax dollars paying for it, then we're going to be eating more and more fish, or continue eating a lot of fish because we think that it's cheap when in reality they're being these stocks are being depleted. Now this isn't really overfishing specifically, but it's overfishing of bycatch or just um, taking bycatch in general. So bycatch is any non-target species that are being caught in your fishing gear, and they're gonna typically die as a result of being caught. Even if they're identified and thrown overboard, they often are going to die because they've been out in the air or they've been um, exposed to some sort of injury or trauma. Okay, so I could show you plenty of pictures, but I'm not going to, but we've all seen pictures of sharks being caught in nets that are um, trying to get tuna or dolphins being caught in tuna nets. All of that would be, um, would be, uh, <laughs> all of that would, would be bycatch. Some ways that we can reduce bycatch, um, acoustic devices. So if there are species such as dolphins that avoid acoustic noises or certain noises, um, we can, install those devices on, on the ship, project those noises into the water, and dolphins will avoid that while we're fishing for tuna, which are not sensitive to those um, devices. Um, glow ropes or glow nets, those are illuminated nets. Um, they are either a phosphorescent glow or they're, um, you're typically a phosphorescent glow that will startle certain organisms and keep them away from those nets or those lines, um, especially organisms that see in color. Um, which most marine organisms do, but then your target species will hopefully not, and you can get that. Bird scaring devices. A lot of birds are caught up in nets, or trapped in nets um, that are intended for fish because they um, are trying to get those fish that are trapped in the nets and they become entangled themselves. So many devices to scare birds, whether that is noise or whether that's a visual cue or what it, whatever it is. Um, dyed bait is very similar to a glow rope. Um, you put in a, um, a phosphorescent or other type of dye that either that attracts a certain species and other species aren't attracted to it, or the opposite, it scares away other species. As you can tell, I'm talking about this in very generic terms um, because there are so many species in the, in the ocean and this is very complex. Each one of these has to be tried and tested um, before we can actually uh, you know, use it effectively. All of these other ones um, also work. So, you know, using lights to scare off certain species um, or to attract others. Uh, scent compounds, same thing. The type of nets and fishing methods. I'm just gonna leave it at that because again, it is so varied. Same thing with the type of hooks. Excluder devices are interesting. An excluder device is any device that allows um, small fish or small species to get through, whereas it, keeps the large fish or larger species. So let's just say um, 
or the opposite. So I'll talk about it um, the first way first and then the second way second. Um, so say that we have our net and we have these small areas in the back of it where little fish can get through, but the big fish get trapped. Alternatively, an excluder device could be where you have your net and you're fishing for small fish, say sardines, and all of your small fish get caught in this net but there are these large structures at the front of it that prevent large fish from going through. Okay, so a fish that is this size, yes, that's a fish. A fish that's that size won't be able to go through, whereas your tiny little sardines will be able to get through. So that's two ways that we can use an excluder device. Really, excluder device uh, should be, is more technically the second way. Okay, you have these devices up there that exclude the large ones, but you could also think of it as small openings in the back that allow out small fish. It just depends on what you're fishing and what you're trying to avoid by catching. All right. Um, and then we can look at the reduction of elimination of trawling and long line fishing. We've talked about both of those in class, but as a reminder, trawling, bottom trawling is where you have um, your ship. Okay, so yes, that's a ship. And off of that ship in the water, you have this giant net. There's the bottom of the ocean. I'll do the net in a different color. You have this giant net that is weighted and rolling along the bottom of the ocean, and it's just picking up anything in its path. Um, and as it's rolling along the bottom of the ocean, it's destroying habitat such as deep sea corals or um, cold water corals or sponges or anything that is um, bound to the substrate down there at the bottom of the ocean. Lawn line fishing, if I use the same boat, it's where you're going to have few fishing lines and thousands of hooks on that one line, each with bait on it. And you're not really, you are targeting one specific fish, um, say tuna, but you're catching a lot of other stuff um, with that. And you're leaving those hooks out there for quite some time so that fish um, can potentially die on those hooks before you reel it all in and remove the bycatch. Okay. Again, all very general overview because we don't have to talk about specific species um, and what works with different groups, but just generic overview. Probably the most effective way to mitigate overfishing is to establish marine protected areas, or MPAs. You'll often see them abbreviated as MPAs. These are areas um, that are protected in one way or another, and they are set up um, either for multi-use, for single use, or for no-take zones. And we see in this diagram, or this map, um, multi-use in the orange and no-take in, um, in the green. No-take means that, they, that you cannot take any fish from that, okay? You can't take any species. It's completely 100% protected. Multi-use is um, you can use it for recreation. You can take certain species, maybe at certain times of year, but it's heavily regulated, okay? Um, you can see that the that these marine protected areas, obviously only the larger ones are shown on this world map, but marine protected areas represent a pretty small proportion of the world's oceans. Only about 6.35% oh, 6 of the world's oceans are in a marine protected area. And of the entire ocean, less than 2% is no take. The largest um, two no take zones is Chagos in the Indian Ocean, which is um, set up by the United Kingdom. And you can see the size of it there. And then um, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this, but a Hawaiian Marine um, National Monument um, around the northwest uh, um, islands of Hawaii and extending into the open ocean. Okay, but you can see the other uh, countries um, primarily, you know, we got a, a few from the USA, a couple from Australia, um, etc. Okay. The other two are aquaculture and awareness. Um, we talk about awareness a lot in this class, so I'm basically going to skip it. But awareness could include anything from public service announcements to signs to um, documentaries, all of that stuff that just generates awareness among the public. And then we'll talk about aquaculture in the second half of this PowerPoint.
But before we get to aquaculture, I want to put up this slide. I'm not going to go through this slide, but you guys can pause this now. There's just too many facts and figures for me to read to you, but read this um, slide. And now let's get into aquaculture. Aquaculture is also known as aqua farming or fish farming. You will often see fish farming, especially in news um, articles or in the general um, public or layman's terms. But for this class, I want you guys to use this term aquaculture on tests and quizzes and whatnot. Okay, this is raising any type of species in a aquatic setting, okay, or a marine setting, okay. So those species can range from fish to mollusks, um, such as um, uh, clams or oysters, etc., to alligators, like they raise in the southern United States, um, crustaceans such as shrimp or lobster, even uh, crabs, and even seaweeds or plants. Um, seaweed is an algae, technically outside of Kingdom Plantae, so plants would be separate from seaweed. Okay, um, some pros of aquaculture, and this is really compared to commercial fishing. It's not really, um, you know, compared to your subsistence, subsistence fishing um, by small little fishing community that's not really in global markets. This is really commercial fishing. First off, it's highly efficient. So you have a lot of fish in a very small area, and it is very efficient um, in the ways that you uh, in the ways that you grow, harvest, and uh, process those fish. That leads to food security. If you have a bad fishing year, that's really bad if you're a subsistence um, community. But if you can rely on having a known number of fish in your um, in your uh, aquaculture pens um, continually, then it's 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 greater food security for the people okay requires little fossil fuel use um, compared to commercial fishing you don't have to travel as far because many of these are relatively near shore you also do not have to spend time searching for fish and therefore spend uh, fuel fossil fuels um, searching for those fish theoretically there should be no bycatch even when there is a tiny bit of bycatch it's a tiny bit so there's no bycatch you reduce the litter um, as we will talk about when we get to uh, pollution, the one of the largest sources of litter, especially plastic pollution, in the um, in the oceans is fishing gear. Okay, um, any line that gets snagged, any nets that have holes in them, it's just easier to throw it overboard rather than to um, bring it into port and repair it. So you reduce all of that because you're not going out and fishing as much and the nets that you are using are relatively stationary, right? Because this is, um, this is stuck in one place, okay? Requires a very small area of water. So very small size. That means the problem with that though, which we'll get to on the next slide, is that the population density of those fish is really high. But um, it does mean that you're using a small amount of water. Um, you can harvest animals at a specific market size, so you can have consistent size um, animals for market. Um, and that's at like, you know, peak tastiness or whatever, I, I don't know. Um, some species can be beneficial to the surrounding environment. Seaweed is a great example of that. Um, they are primary producers, they can provide habitat. Um, bivalves are another example, so oysters. Um, are a great example because they filter pollutants out of water and they um, filter, you know, um, they just uh, are, are, they filter uh, many of the um, aquatic organisms out of water, um, like the larval stage of many organisms. Uh, it can boost local economy, raise more food than the natural system can sustainably support, and relieves the strain on those natural habitats and fisheries. But with everything, there are cons to aquaculture as well. One of the biggest cons is habitat destruction. So this is huge, especially in, in your near shore or offshore habitats, mangroves, saltgrass meadows, kelp forests, reefs. Those are hugely biodiverse habitats and huge carbon sinks in their own right. So removing those habitats or destroying those habitats is um, not good at all. I have a couple um, images of that. So up at the top right, we, um, sorry, uh, kind of top center, we see lots and lots of fish farms. This is an on the ground image from what we're looking at over here. 
So that's the same place. We're looking at shrimp farms um, primarily. And this is the Gulf of Fonseca, one of the most biodiverse places um, in Central America, or at least the coasts of Central America. And it what was once um, mostly mangrove forest, and you can see 1987, what was once mostly mangrove forest is now primarily fish farms, or sorry, shrimp farms. So they're, they're farming shrimp there. Okay. And you can see the extent of that habitat change. Okay. Um, it can contaminate. So another con of aquaculture is that aquaculture can contaminate the surrounding water with lots and lots of fish waste. Okay. You have a very high concentration of fish in one area and they are all, um, you know, doing their little fish waste thing as a process of metabolism. Um, and that's a lot of fish waste in one area. If all of these are packed full of, let's just say salmon, that is a lot of salmon poop all in one place. And it can overwhelm the natural system and could lead to eutrophication. Um, it requires a food source. This one is also pretty big. And we'll see this in one of the documentaries that we, that we show, um, maybe depending on which documentary. Um, it might be genetically modified corn. That is not a fish's natural diet. A lot of salmon are eating um, corn right now. And there's nothing with it being gen genetically modified um, that's bad for the salmon. It's the fact that it's corn that's bad for the salmon. Salmon do not eat corn. Salmon are a predatory fish. So if they were eating their natural diet, what we have to do is go out and harvest lots and lots and lots of little fish for those salmon to eat. So instead of overfishing the salmon, we are now overfishing the little fish to feed to our farm-raised salmon. Okay. Sticking with salmon, um, genetically modified salmon um, exist, and they are being raised um, primarily on the East Coast of the United States. Um, if they jump out of one of these pens, they can... Um, enter the natural population, breed with the natural populations, introduce those GM um, genetically modified genes into the natural population, the trans genes from other species into the natural population, and they can um, either interbreed with or outcompete the natural fish. Okay, um, and then getting back to high population densities, um, that can spread disease quickly, especially if they're all swimming around in their own waste. Um, that can easily and very quickly spread disease, just like um, in any area where you have high population density. So we're left with this dilemma. About a third of the world population uh, relies on the oceans as their main source of protein. Okay, um, so for protein. That is a very significant part of the human population. So we're going to have to use the oceans um, to feed people. So, and, but we have to do it in a sustainable manner. We can't do it in a way that overfishes natural or wild fish stocks. And we shouldn't do it in a way that leads to habitat destruction um, or to pollution or to any of the other cons that we had on the previous slide. So I was reading this article and I thought that I would share it with you guys. Um, I might share it in class, but I'll at least abbreviate it here. What could a modern sustainable aquaculture and again, sustainable aquaculture operation look like? So they envision, the authors of this envision spreading those fish pens out at sea so they don't destroy coastal habitat, right? They're not destroying your mangrove forests. They're not destroying your saltgrass meadows or your, um, or your sea grasses or your coral reefs. They're spread out at sea. They use a larger area, okay? Um, they're at low density over a large area in the open ocean. We have plenty of space in the ocean, even just offshore in the open ocean. And that minimizes, um, that, uh, minimizes your disease and therefore your antibiotic use. What that also minimizes is the amount of fish waste in a very small area. Okay, but I'll get to that in a little bit. The fish are fed on insect protein. Where does that insect protein come from? It comes from urban farms that raise billions of flies and beetles on food waste from nearby cities. Food waste is huge. You probably know when we've talked about it in class that anywhere from a third 
to half of all food raised in the U.S. is wasted, okay, whether that's at the farm or whether that's on your plate or through the whole process of processing that food. If we can take that food waste, let's just say it's from restaurants, collect it all in a separate garbage can, right, instead of having um, garbage recycling only, we have garbage recycling food waste. Send all that food waste not to a composting facility, but to a urban farm where they raise um, insects on that food waste. And we harvest those insects probably at the adult stage, but maybe at the larval stage, and dry them, I, dry them out, crush them into pellets that we then feed to our fish. Sustainable way to, um, raise, to raise our fish, to feed our fish, okay? The great thing about that is that we also will get compost from that because those uh, beetles and flies what we're really getting is insect manure are going to poop out all of the waste and we can use that to spread on our crops okay great fertilizer the fish farms are, are multi-layered and i'll show a diagram of that on the next slide with fish above and cages of urchins and sea cucumbers, um, which are both popular foods in Asia below the fish, which are fed on the fish waste, which are fed by the fish waste rather. Those pens are surrounded um, by ropes of bivalves, such as oysters or clams, and edible seaweed that feed on any excess waste. Fossil fuel, fuel use is minimized, although we do have to use fossil fuels to get um, further out at sea, but we still minimize it compared to commercial wild-caught fishing. Antibiotic use is minimized, pollution is minimized, litter is minimized, food waste is minimized, bycatch minimized. So let's see what one of those looks like in a diagram. Okay, so what I want to first point out is the current is moving in this direction from left to right. We see a person for scale and relatively large fish in this. And in this case, we even have what looks to be like two species of fish. They have the dark blue fish and the light blue fish or the navy blue fish or whatever. This is a very large pen. So they're, um, you know, the population density is low. It's a fully enclosed pen. So fish cannot jump out and outcompete or breed with wild stocks. They represent the insect protein um, that's being fed off of, uh, so we, what we have, I think that's insect, maybe that's algae, but insect protein or food waste um, being used as food. We are reducing or eliminating the use of antibiotics because our population density is low. The fish waste, solid fish waste is dropping and you have, um, you know, oyster, or, sorry, uh, uh, sea cucumbers, um, or uh, sea urchins and lobster that are feeding off of that fish waste and their own pens. We have fish waste that is moving with the current and being taken up by, um, by bivalves like mussels or oysters. And any waste from them is being taken up by edible seaweed. Okay, so minimizing pollution, minimizing the waste um, from this. And then finally, I'll link all of these below. Um, we should, I, we're, we're going to watch a, um, not all of these, but at least the first three in class. And I'm not sure about one of those other two. I might assign it for homework one day, um, or we'll watch one in class. I'm not sure. And back to the learning objectives. So the essential knowledge, um, overfishing has led to extreme scarcity of some fish species, which can lessen biodiversity in aquatic um, systems and harm people who depend on fishing for food. And as we talked about, there's quite a few other impacts of overfishing as well. So the essential knowledge for aquaculture, aquaculture is expanded because it's highly efficient. It requires only small areas of water and requires little fuel. Aquaculture can contaminate wastewater. What this is really talking about is the wastewater from aquaculture can contaminate nearby um, um, natural systems. And fish that escape may compete or breed with wild fish. That's especially worrying with genetically modified uh, fish interbreeding with wild fish. The density of fish in aquaculture can lead to increases in disease incidences, which can be transmitted to wild fish. Okay, so pretty bare bones um, for the essential knowledge, but there is a lot that is um, that we're able to unpack out of all that. Anyway, I hope that you guys learned something and I'll see you all in class. Bye.